All right. Um, great. So um, one thing that we talked about before is that reading bios is really less fun than it could be. Um, so instead, I'd love to just ask you by way of introduction, what's your superhero power <laughs> in your dream world? <laughs> well, it's interesting because I have a three-year-old. So I think a lot about superheroes, a lot. <laughs> superheroes are a big part of my life. Um, but I think the superpower that I would like to have, I can't remember the name of the superhero, but it's one of the X-Men, and it's the guy who goes really, really, really fast, so he's able to get so much done. And for him, a day is like a year, because he can do so much. So that would be the superpower I would like to have, so I could get all the things done at home and at work that I'd love to do. <laughs> I'd like that one too. Yes. Maybe our next guide will be on how to turn time. Cultivate that <laughs> superpowers. Yeah. Would it be helpful for me to say a little bit about who I am? Too, I just, would love that. Okay, yeah. great. Um, especially since folks were expecting Kathy, and of course she apologizes that she couldn't be here. Uh, she unfortunately is, was ill, um, but she's here in spirit. Uh, so I'm Jamaica Maxwell, and I'm a program officer at the Packard Foundation in our organizational effectiveness team. I'm the program officer that works with all of our conservation and science grantees, as well as our population and reproductive health grantees. So. Um, which are our two biggest programs at the foundation. And then we have another program officer who works with our Children and Families program and our local grant making program. And prior to joining the foundation, I was uh, a consultant, a strategy consultant for, for 12 years at a firm in the city. So that's my background. That's great. So tell us before I start grilling you on a couple questions related sure. to assessment and power, can you just tell us a bit about the OE program and mm -hmm. sort of what we need to know about the context of where you work and how you guys approach your work generally? Right. Well, our overall theory of change is that organizations with stronger leadership, management, and operations are better equipped to achieve their programmatic goals and achieve their missions. Um, so that's our, that's our overall theory of change. We've been around for actually Actually about 30 years in one shape or form. Uh, David Packard actually launched the program in the early 80s. It's taken multiple turns since then but has been basically in its current formation as the organizational effectiveness program for about 10 or 15 years. Um, anything else you want me to say about that? I could go much deeper. But I mean, how how many grantees about do you have? Ah, uh, okay, Just yeah. So to in a give given us year, an idea of the size. Sure. So in a given year, we make about ninety grants, sometimes mm -hmm. a little bit more or sometimes fewer. Right. Uh, and we've had actually about a thousand grantees since nineteen ninety seven. Wow. Yeah. And you know what? I shouldn't have even asked. I should have just pulled up a map and, and figured right. it out for myself. Yes. But, you know, sometimes talking to people is good too. So, um, great. Well, that's good background. Um, so, maybe I should yeah. say a little bit yeah, more yeah. about the types of projects we support. Sure. So, the majority of what our, our grants look like is we do grants to individual Packard Foundation grantees, existing Packard Foundation grantees, to carry out a capacity building project that focuses on usually one or two project focuses areas and those could be strategic planning, communications planning, leadership development, coaching, fund development, and on and on. Um, we actually have a very long list of the types of projects that we support related to, to capacity building. Great. Um, that's really helpful. So I know that one thing that Kathy really helped inform on this guide and, and that you guys have been leaders on for years is assessment mm -hmm. and part of why I think that you've been leaders is that to you it's not the holy grail you've figured out a way to define for yourselves what it is and sort of how to approach it and the reason I'm using the term holy grail is that almost all of the folks that we interviewed and these are people who do capacity building um, they defined assessment as the holy grail that was the exact phrase that they were using mm -hmm. um, so I mean one of the things that we broke down in the guide is that we really heard, especially from Kathy and the rest of your team, that mm -hmm. um, assessment is a process. So it starts even before a grant is made when you're figuring out, like, what's the actual purpose of this? Um, is it to change an organization and move the needle in an organization, or is it to move a field or build a movement? Um, so that's sort of the before part. There's like a lot with assessment that happens during a grant and then mm -hmm. also a lot after. So that's how we frame it in the guide, but I'm curious to hear how you found the holy grail and, <laughs> and what you think about assessment of capacity building grants. Yeah, well there's so, there's bless you, there's so much to be said about assessment and it's many different forms. Um, I think one thing that we've really been trying to push the envelope on is around evaluation after the grants have been made. Um, and 
measuring uh, the impact of capacity build building is a challenge and it's something that we're constantly in conversation with our colleagues about well how how do we get beyond self-reported data which is really what we use uh, to inform our evaluation uh, so we we have an evaluation plan that we feel pretty good about it's actually up on our wiki we have a wiki page that uh, has a lot of resources we um, are really transparent about our strategy and our and our evaluation plan, and I wrote down the website because I never remember it. It's <laughs> packard-foundation-oe.wikispaces.com. So that's a really uh, useful resource to go check out how we're doing evaluation. We'd love to hear how other foundations are doing evaluation. So what kind of kinds of questions do we try to answer through the evaluation? And I wrote them down because I don't remember them all, all, all the details. Um, but it's questions like, to what extent do OE grants result in greater organizational impact, greater uh, field impact, greater programmatic outcomes related to the work being funded on the programmatic side, not just on the capacity building side. Uh, and and we, we also want to know, of course, in the nearer term, what if the grant objectives are met, and then also one or two years after the grant has closed, have those, uh, has the capacity that has been built been sustained? So that's really interesting also to find out. Not only because especially for capacity building, not only um, do you want to hear what happened during the grant period, but what happens a year after? And it, does the capacity building really last? So and are you asking those questions through your final reports or mm -hmm. through conversations or just sort of doing your own investigating? Right, good question. So most of it, well, it's through a, a bunch of different um, materials, but it's definitely final reports. We also have external evaluators that do an, an interview mm -hmm. um, with a selection, with a random selection of grantees a year afterward. Uh, we also speak to our program officers who we collaborate with on these capacity building grants mm -hmm. to get a sense of have they seen the results that we're hearing about through the reports. So it's a bunch of different methods, really. Great. Yeah, and we have a lot of our results available online, and we share it with our grantees and our program staff and with our foundation collaborators as well. That's great. Did you share that wiki address again? Sure, yeah, and I also could definitely write it down somewhere so it could be circulated, sure. you know, electronically. But it's packard-foundation-oe.wikispaces.com. This, this, the wiki spaces, you know, website creates these, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> these long uh, addresses. Yeah, uh, so the other thing I wanted to say was just around, around assessments is that we use them in a lot of different ways. And one way that we've actually been using assessments quite a bit now is when we're moving into new geographies or we're working with a new group of grantees. And there has been a real interest um, by, the, by the grantees in working with us collaboratively to understand what their needs are and where they would like to build capacity. So we actually use an assessment as a participatory group experience to work together with the grantees to understand their needs. Uh, and this relates to the power conversation later on, but it really changes the dynamic of how we're working with our grantees and how candid that they're being with their needs. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think something that we saw in our research is that you guys are a larger foundation. You have some different resources and different staff available. And even in the smaller foundations, trust is something that that was sort of that was the main thing that funders were really focused on with capacity building in particular. How can we have a candid understanding of the needs and how can mm -hmm. we really hear if something is working? Um, and so for some people it's using third parties and working with other staff, but at smaller foundations, board members sometimes can play mm -hmm. a really important role and sometimes anonymous surveys and um, members of the community even sharing what their perception of change has been. So it's neat to hear your experience and, and see how it can translate in some ways too across the board. Right, right. I think it's actually very helpful that I, I'm separate from the program um, yeah. PO. Uh, so I'm asking very different questions of the grantee than the program program officer who's yeah. asking questions about specific programmatic outcomes. I'm asking right. questions like, what's keeping you up at night? And what do you need to take, take your work to the next level? Yeah. yeah. That's great. So I guess uh, one question that I definitely wanted to ask you, um, because I know it's a curiosity of a lot of people in the room, is do you require organizational assessments? And if you do, why? And if you don't, why? We do not require organizational assessments. I think they're a fabulous tool. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, it, well, a couple things. First, 
We work with our program staff to identify the, the organizations that um, are priority for organizational effectiveness funding. So these, these grantees have, are, are already partners, they've already been vetted, they've already gone through due diligence, usually the program PO knows them pretty well. Uh, and so it's, it's an ongoing partnership frequently with these grantees, uh, and we're usually uh, jumping in after a couple years of grant making, sometimes not, but frequently. Uh, so an OA at that point doesn't necessarily feel necessary. Also, we don't necessarily want to require of all of our grantees. It feels like it could be quite burdensome, uh, really depending, of course, on the size of the organization uh, and the resources available to do it. Yeah. Yeah. But it is a tool that we use. <laughs> um, so, I, and actually, I've had conversations, two conversations this week, with organizations that um, in the past I mentioned, hey, you should check out these OA tools. We have actually an OA page on our wiki uh, that lists both free and low cost OA tools. So I've, I've sent a lot of people there. And I said, you know, check mm -hmm. it out. Check it out. Maybe it's something you want to do. Maybe it doesn't feel right. Maybe it feels burdensome. It's up to you. Mm -hmm. And especially if organizations come to me and they say, oh, I have an interest in this or that. I'm not quite sure what we really need. Um, or I think we should do this, but uh, my board chair thinks this, and I'm not sure where we go next. An OA is a perfect tool for that. Several members of the staff mm -hmm. and the leadership can carry it out, and it can really launch a conversation. So again, I've had two conversations this week where, where yeah. groups actually did do an OA. It has been extremely helpful for them to hone in themselves on what they would like to work on. That's great, and just because part of the conversation is meant to drive toward power, something that I hear in that statement too, because you mentioned the tension of, of the staff and the board and mm -hmm. like the role of the funder there too, and so sometimes having an assessment tool, mm -hmm. um, it can help sort of be a middleman, so to speak, in those conversations, because mm -hmm. it's something that everyone can more objectively step back and look at rather than mm -hmm. it being driven by the board member, or the staff, or, right. or the funder. Right, exactly. Um, but the last thing I will say on OA is that actually we do have a couple programs, our newer programs, mm -hmm. where we are actually integrating OA from the beginning. So we have a new program launching right now where every grantee is going through A, but it's funded through the foundation. Mm -hmm. So there will be resources provided to help them both go through the survey itself and interpret the results. But it, they will own that, and um, what they would like to report to us or how they would like to use it is up to them. And will that be used for assessment for you guys, or is that more part of the beginning of, of the process? So they actually are going to own their results. It will mm -hmm. be um, compiled, and every two years there will be, the OA will be repeated for this group of grantees, so we can track, this is, these are in areas where we're really trying to track field building and the overall increase of capacity mm -hmm. in a given sector, in a given geography. So we will be tracking the, the aggregated results, but individually, each organization will own their results, and it's up to them whether they want to report back to us on what they've learned and where they want to work on individual capacity building. Interesting. Yeah. Well, that leads nicely maybe into my next question, um, which is a curiosity about the structure of a grant initially can indicate a lot about its success. So can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about how you try to structure OE grants from the beginning um, with results and you know, evaluation in mind. Sure, and this could be a two-hour conversation. This could be. Yeah, <laughs> stick around so, after. <laughs> so we um, we call our form of grant making strategically responsive. <laughs> That's the uh, the words we use in our team. And That's a great phrase. Yeah, yeah, and so what that looks like in practice is that we work again closely in partnership with our program colleagues to hear um, what they're seeing among their grantees, what needs they're seeing. But once we've identified the grantees we're going to work with, um, then it, it, the conversation changes and we become very responsive. And so the conversation usually starts with me, like I said earlier, asking the, the grantee, what, what do you need to take your goals and missions and your organizational's, organization's effectiveness to the next level? And like I said earlier, what's keeping you up at night? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it becomes very quickly a conversation where we're listening uh, and we're listening more than talking. 
uh, to get a sense of really what's going on in that organization and, and how we can best support them. And sometimes organizations come with a really clear need. They say, oh man, we haven't had a new strategic plan in six years. There's no doubt that that's what we need to do. We need to do it yesterday. And then it's, it's how can we make that ha happen as quickly as possible. But other, other times it's a lot more complicated. Uh, and, and then it becomes more of a coaching, an advisory, um, sometimes a shoulder to cry on, sometimes mm -hmm. a sounding board, depending on what's, what's needed at that moment. So that's a little bit about the beginning of the conversation. Once we really have a sense of what, we hone in on what that focus is, then we really want to get clear on what will be achieved through that project. Um, they usually find an external consultant that they want to work with to build their capacity or complete whatever planning exercise is occurring. And then we really want to be clear on the specific objectives that will be, a, that will be achieved within the grant period and whatever longer term or overarching goal is driving the work. Um, and, and you just mentioned that they pick a consultant. They do, yes. They pick it, not you. That's, yes, okay. yes. Sometimes uh, organizations, especially those new to capacity building, ask for our assistance in sure. identifying. And we have a pretty extensive database at this point from you know a, quite a bit of grant making in this space. Yeah. So we do frequently run lists and share lists of um, consultants that have been used in the past by organizations. But we also very much encourage the organizations to you know, tap their networks, mm -hmm. um, look far and wide, and we very much emphasize that the consultant choice is, is in their hands. And, um, and we have found time and time again that uh, that match and finding the right match, whether both culturally, content-wise, everything, finding that right match with a consultant is, is so key and is one of the indicators to success. Absolutely, and that's one of the things in, in the nonprofit focus groups that we did, mm -hmm. and even in the technical assistance provider focus groups, I think that was one of the biggest complaints, um, where mm. the biggest pet peeves, where uh, if a nonprofit was sort of assigned a consultant that wasn't a right fit, and even for the TA providers, if they were going into sort of a hostile situation or where they felt like it just mm -hmm. wasn't their services that were actually the right fit, but it was sort of funder determined, mm -hmm. um, it set it up for failure. Yeah. And it made it a little bit harder. The, the power dynamic really played a bigger role in those grants, and mm -hmm. maybe they weren't as designed for success as they could be. So that's actually... I know we didn't pre-talk about that, but that was an excellent <laughs> point to me. Well, and just one more thing I would say that I think is really key to success is having the right leadership in the organization engaged in the project from the beginning. Yeah. So if you don't have, you know, the AD on board or, you know, a board member supportive, it can be an uphill battle. So, if, so that's just another thing that I would, I would say. Yeah, that's great. So I guess transitioning a little bit to talk more explicitly about power. Um, power came up in every single one of the interviews that we did, the focus groups, the survey, um, and I know that you've sat in a lot of different roles. Um, you know, before coming to Packard, you've been on the nonprofit side, you've done some consulting, and so I feel like you especially probably have really interesting perspectives on power. And so I'm curious to hear, one, like, what sort of power you feel like you do or don't have mm -hmm. in this role? Um, but also just what are some of the power dynamics that you've observed playing out in different roles that you've held that you think yeah. people should be aware of? Um, well, I think funders do have power um, and it's, it's purely because we are holding the purse strings um, in a given moment. Uh, so there is a power dynamic and I think one of the most helpful things for me when I joined the foundation is that through our both basically onboarding process there's some required training and one of them is actually on power dynamics I think one of the most important thing, things a funder could do is just acknowledge that there is that power dynamic mm -hmm. and uh, in every room you enter that exists and I think just being self-aware is half the battle right mm -hmm. and, and, and if you're aware of it then it will of course influence how you're interacting with with everyone, grantees, other funders, et cetera. Um, so, so what I can say about from the various hats that I've worn, so I was a consultant basically carrying out OE projects for a long time, uh, and now here I am having very similar types of conversations with organizations, asking the same questions, um, but now wearing a funder hat. And, and what I've learned is it's harder to get the answers as a funder. Uh, it's harder to get to the point where people are candid and, and trusting and, and ready to be honest and show vulnerability. And in order to do capacity building work, in order to get to the answers to the questions that I've mentioned um, about what's really the, what are really the pain points of an organization, there has to be that relationship. Uh, so luckily, 
you know, I'm in a position at the foundation, again, because I'm separate from the program, uh, program POs and program grants that organizations are receiving, it's a different, I can have a different relationship. Uh, and it, it sometimes takes a bit of time for grantees to make the transition to realize, oh, she's asking really different um, questions and, and um, wants to have a, a different um, back and forth with me. Uh, so I think it, it takes longer. Um, and, uh, and I think just to be very aware um, of, of how the types of questions you're asking can really influence that power dynamic. And then going back to that, that strategically responsive piece, listening mm -hmm. uh, and putting yourself in the role of listener as much as possible also um, really helps with the power dynamic for sure. Definitely, that's great advice. And I wanna pick up on a point that you said at the beginning of, of that wonderful set of remarks, which is that it's part of your onboarding at Packard. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think there are a lot of funders who are hungry for that. And that's actually one of the one of the action steps that we suggest in the guide, like yeah. for you know, talking about power as an organization. So how how are you guys talking about power? Yeah, well it's really interesting and um Kathy's Kathy Rich, my boss, is actually who we have to thank for these trainings. It's a set of trainings and that's just one of the topics mm -hmm. that's covered related to becoming a grant maker, really. It's a grant maker orientation. Um, so it's a really honest conversation between their two very experienced POs and then a group of new program staff. Uh, and it wasn't something, it, it was something that I had thought about sort of abstractly. Oh, you know, yeah, funders have, there's this dynamic between yeah. funders and grantees and other organizations. But no one talks about it, right? No one has a conversation just mm -hmm. head on about, about the power dynamic. And so it's, a, it's really an open conversation. It's a casual conversation like we're right. having around a table um, talking about a couple experiences that various P POs have had, the experienced POs sharing, oh, here's where you know I, I had a tough situation and then I realized it was because of the power mm -hmm. dynamic uh, and how they, how they dealt with them and then some tips for the new grant makers. But you don't really know until you're in it and then you're, you're trying it out. But thankfully I had that before I was really engaged talking to a lot of grantees. That's great. So I'm going to ask you for one of those stories in a second, and I'll share one of my favorites um, from the guide. Um, and it's a favorite in the sense that it's really telling of the power that funders have without always realizing it and how we sort of have to be on at all moments. So one funder um, from a smaller foundation who really has strong relationships with grantees and a really honest, candid dialogue um, she was talking with a grantee and sort of made an offhand remark just that, oh, you know, you're doing all this work and your mission statement doesn't really show that. Like, you guys might want to update that at some point. And, um, and how long do you guys think it took for the mission statement to change? Any guesses? Two Any years. Quickly. Two years. Any other guesses? Two, days. Two months. Two days is very close. It took one week and like suddenly new mission statement. And it was sort of this like moment for the funder of like, well, gosh, like I did mean what I said, but not quite as as fiercely as they took it of like change it now. But but grantees will often sort of hang on to the every word. And so um, one of the things with power that we sort of profile here is like the casual remark is something that we have to even be really careful about. Um, and so that's like one of a bunch of examples that we share in the guide. We tried to structure it as sort of a things to do, things to recognize and things to be aware of. Um, and playing off of some of the themes that, that you've hinted at in, in some of your different stories, but just to name a few, like capacity building is not the core of any nonprofit's work, <laughs> even if it's something that they really want to do. Um, and so there's always sort of tensions of time and attention. With any change, there comes anxiety. And when we're anxious, you know, people can get a little defensive. Mm -hmm. um, that plays out on the funder side, too, of sometimes we really want to engage in an effort and then we sort of overcompensate for what we don't know by getting defensive or, or being really forceful about something. And so there were just a lot of these tensions that came up in the interviews where I think funders did recognize the the power dynamics that that affect both sides of the equation, right? It's not just the funder experience, it's also what's happening on the nonprofit side. And so I'm curious to hear, like if you can share a story or two, just about how power has either gotten in the way of a mm -hmm. grant reaching its full potential, or has maybe helped it. Like maybe both parties sort of recognized what was going on and, and power dynamics could be leveraged for good. Hmm. So, um, 
My story is very similar to the one you mentioned about the mission statement. Uh, and it just happened recently where I was having a back and forth over email. And email can be very dangerous for this, too. Um, and I mentioned I was just providing um, a little bit of feedback on an idea for a capacity building project. And I said, oh, well, there's this resource. It's a book. Um, and I think it might be really helpful for you to take a look at. Um, but here are the next steps you know, that I think we should take. Um, and I, I just sort of mentioned the book offhand. And in uh, his response, the grantee said to me, I will study the book. I'll report back on what I've learned from it and how it applies to this project idea. And so then I had to say, wait, 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 I, it's a very long book. Not all of it will apply. You don't have to read it. It's just a potential resource. So it's very similar to, to what you experienced or what you yeah. heard that's a story about the mission statement. Um, you know, and because I'm since so I'm a new grant maker and luckily I had that onboarding, I haven't had a lot of other um, negative um, experiences related to power dynamics yet besides those that I've sort of mentioned yeah. where, um, where it's been mainly about relationship building and breaking down that wall right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. um, definitely in a lot of the conversations I have at the beginning of a relationship with a new a grantee that's new to me, um, there's a lot of feeling each other out. And um, I, I sometimes, especially for a grantee that's new to our program, and I when I ask a question about, well, what, what sort of project are you interested in? I, they're looking at me for the answer when I'm really looking to them to hear what they need. So there's sometimes a little bit of a dance there, <laughs> um, I think, because of the power dynamics yeah. that, that um, could be more efficient, probably. Yeah, no, that makes good sense. And I, you know, after I asked the question, I was thinking, oh, what, what would my example of like using power for good be? Um, and I'll share one from when I was a funder, um, which is what I did before this. Um, and we had this grantee. They, they were a recipient for I want to say like three or four years. Like really loved their organization. Um, they, they build, um, they build implements out of cardboard to help kids with disabilities. I mean, it's really cool stuff. Um, and, and, and then the other piece of what they do is they employ women who recently, you know, were able to get out of the, the justice system. So really just amazing program. Um, and like my, one of my favorite grantees. And so the renewal proposal was something that they didn't spend any time on. Um, and we got it and it was a proposal that didn't go through any second set of eyes and, mm. you know, didn't answer any questions. And it, it was hard to read. And um, as a funder, there's always the question of like, well, you get a terrible proposal, but you know really good things about the organization. What do you do? And so I think a power that I felt like we used well in that case was, you know, they got the grant again, but with the contingent that you know, first we're going to meet to talk about, like, we're redlining this proposal and we're going to mm -hmm. go through it with you and and sort of show you what our reaction was because if we were investing in this organization, we were doing it because we believed in them and we want other funders to right. also support. But with that sort of proposal, they wouldn't have been able to get support from other funders, especially new ones. So that actually worked out really well and I, I was nervous about it, but we got a thank you note, you know, I, several months later that, you know, they had updated their proposal and would we like to see it just sort of as an example of what they've been able to do with the advice. And, and so I think that there are ways when you can recognize your power as like you have the ultimate hard power of does somebody get grant money, but, but you can also build in, you know, the non-monetary capacity building with some of that power in recognizing what you know. So like, we were good writers and, you know, sort of knew what we were looking for so we could build their capacity in that way. So you sparked an uh, one for me, too. Oh, excellent. Yeah, so frequently we have, especially uh, grantees who are new to capacity building, they may come to us and say, here's a list of eight things that I want to work on. Mm -hmm. um, and that might be strategic planning and communications planning and leadership coaching and staff training for everyone and on and on and on. And we know from our experiences and from a lot of evaluation that when you're focusing on more than basically two project focus areas related to capacity building, especially when they're engaging the senior leadership of the organization, it takes a lot of time and it takes yeah. a lot of energy. And if you really want that capacity building to be effective and work and last, you have to focus. <laughs> so that's one way that we frequently, even if yeah. they have a very clear reasoning why they want to do their list of four or six activities, that we really try to narrow it down and we say we, we really 
they have to for for your to help you. Let's narrow this down. So that's that's one way. It's a small way. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> great. So um, I wanted to just see if there are any questions in the room before we sort of give our closing thoughts and take a short break before we we break up into our deep dive components. Yeah, and say who you are, why you're here. Great. Um, I'm Samantha. Um, I work in change management consulting, so kind of we don't work with um, with corporate profit organizations, but my background's in nonprofits, so kind of interested in hearing it from different sides. So my two questions um, and things we think about a lot in terms of evaluation. Um, the first part, when you have the external consultant that your um, that the uh, recipient uh, chooses, do do you share? Um, what you felt like, what they've shared with you with them, or like, what's your relationship with that external consultant in terms of, are they kind of going and starting over in terms of assessment, or like, what's your role in mm. that kind of triangle? And then the second part is, when you're looking back and you're evaluating it, how many years down the line, whether it was successful as capacity mm -hmm. building, what if it was a really bad consultant? Like, how, mm -hmm. or maybe your um, the organization just wasn't on board with the process. Like, how mm -hmm. do you evaluate the success mm -hmm. um, of the capacity? So before you answer that, I'll just repeat it back in, in like a couple words for the live stream audience to give you time to think. So that was Samantha Goldman, who does um, change management consulting, among other things. Um, a recent California transplant, so everybody welcome her. Um, <laughs> um, but so she had two main questions, one around what's the dialogue um, and the amount of stuff that's shared between you as the funder and the hired consultant. And then... Um, hard to summarize the second question, but how do you how do you evaluate the success um, if the consultant maybe wasn't the best consultant? Right, so um, <clears throat> I maybe confused things when I was talking about the ex consultant choice earlier. So f the uh, grantee selects the consultant that they work with on the pro whatever project. So if they're doing communications or leadership or whatever, they, they select that consultant. We actually, the Packard Foundation, has hired external evaluators that work with us on evaluating the grants. So we have external consultants that review all of the final grant reports and then do that subset of interviews of a, a random sample of closed grants. Um, so they are using the same data that we are, that we have access to the, when they review the final grant reports. On the interviews, that data is confidential, so we don't, um, we don't see who says what and who you know, responds. Um, does that answer your question? Or I think so. I mean, the external consultant has access to all the information you have access to, mm -hmm. even if you, don't, if you don't actually hire them. We, we hire the external consultant. Oh, you mean, oh, you mean the, the external consultants, whoever. Who do the capacity building, whether it's mm, strategic planning, yeah. like, because you said they don't necessarily want to go in and do their own assessment, but how do they build oh, off oh. your vast knowledge um, without Got it. some of the confidentiality that you might have with the organization? Mm -hmm. Well, okay. oh, I think I got it now, sorry. Okay. So, um, so it's really up to the organization what they want to share. Uh, and so that's a really interesting question, especially in some of the newer areas where we're working, where we're, we are requiring OAs, the organizational assessments for all grantees, and then we also are doing individual OE grants to those grantees. But I, we're going to leave it up to the organization how much they want to share of, of that of that detail. Yeah, and I'll, I'll build on that from um, another funder that we talked with during this research process. Um, they were talking about, maybe not specific to the consultants, but especially when a grantee is a grantee of multiple <laughs> um, departments at the foundation. So like if you're receiving a program grant and an OE grant, for example, um, you might know like six or seven people at the foundation. So it might be, you know, your program specific grant program officer, your capacity building program officer, you might know the people in compliance, you know, whether it's grants management or, or otherwise. And so they were questioning and debating what is what should be the flow of information and what even staff should be able to share with one another. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the most important piece that came out of that conversation is, as with everything we research, there's no one size fits all, but it's what is important is being really explicit with the grantees so that they know when they're putting something in writing or having a conversation, who's going to be informed about that 
communication. So if you're having an off the record conversation, you have to know that it's either totally off the record or off the record means off the record with the rest of my staff knowing. Um, so that was really the most important lesson that came out of that research question. Yeah, and some um, capacity building funders have a firewall between the program yeah. staff and the capacity right. building program staff. So we don't. We actually work pretty closely in partnership, um, but some do. Some do. I think we've, we've decided that the benefits of being in partnership outweigh yeah. the benefits of having a firewall. Yeah, and just being explicit about that makes mm -hmm. it, this the power dynamic again. It makes it harder. A grantee doesn't want to necessarily turn down money, but at least they know exactly what they're getting into. It's mm -hmm. not something where they get halfway in and then suddenly they're surprised that mm -hmm. you all are talking to each other. Yeah. It's part of the way that you've set up your program, mm -hmm. and especially by working with only existing grantees. Right. The one other thing I'd say about the consultant relationship is that the, the organization, the grantee, really owns that relationship. So we happen to be funding the project yeah. uh, and, and, and supporting them every step of the way as they put together the project, but the grantee is the client, and we want to make sure that the consultant feels like that too. Yeah, and I've totally forgotten your second question. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> what other questions are in the room? Yeah. Say your name, to, why uh, you're here. Phil Bishopka, uh, you uh, work in an organization that provides capacity building through Pro Bono. Um, I think you, Jamaica, you touched on a little bit about working with a nonprofit that comes with like a whole suitcase full of needs. Um, and related to the power dynamic and not letting your suggestions rule the day, how, how do you sort of co-explore the um, what we typically find I think we all do. Presenting problems come forward and there's really a set of underlying issues. Mm -hmm. How do you get to those in a respectful, thoughtful, kind of evocative way that let them really be owned and feel proud that they uncovered the golden nut that they, they really want to solve for themselves? So just to repeat for the live stream audience, um, this is Joel from a capacity building organization that does their work through Pro Bono, and he asked a very thoughtful question about how you have those conversations with um, the recipient organization to make sure that you're really having thoughtful, um, detailed conversations that really get to the heart of what it is that they're trying to do. Right, right, and that's that's such a hard question. I. Um, I think it's it's uh, what we all try to do is, is master conversation, right? And it's it's an appreciative inquiry line of questioning um, that's mainly focused on listening. Uh, so I don't think there's a magic formula <laughs> at all. Uh, and I think every probably every person and everyone in a role like I'm in or you're in uh, has a little bit of a different way that that we found useful to do that. Um, that's so that's not very helpful is it sorry <laughs> I, I, I can but, chime in on a but I would yeah. say uh, in addition to that I would say that organizational assessments um, are that's one way that is really helpful um, especially if it really is a laundry list so I frequently see either laundry list or fund development right those are the things I frequently see so um, when I see those things uh, and I have a conversation and we don't make headway uh, and we, uh, it's not clear at the end of that conversation that we're going to be able to narrow that list down, that's when doing some form of OA, whether it's something really light and easy um, or whether it's something a little bit deeper, can be a really helpful exercise. I No, that's great advice. And I, I agree that there's no, it sort of is based very much on the soft skills and your ability to have a good conversation. I'll tie back to a theme you said earlier, listening, 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 yeah. um, which is really important. Um, I'll share a conversation that sort of accidentally came at the very end of this research um, from a woman who worked for an international NGO um, based out of Brazil for 10 years. Um, she was... Um, in one of the leadership roles there. And um, she told me, and we talk about this a little in our lenses chapter, um, she, I sort of asked her that question, like what are, what are things that funders have done to make you feel really comfortable where you can share anything? And she said, we drink, 
Like, and, and so, you know, we had a laugh, and I really appreciated her candor. Um, and as we dug into it a little bit more, you know, she had such a great point. What she, was, what she was trying to say is, you know, we spent time together outside of, you know, the overly planned, and it always is, mm-hmm. hour-long site visit or two-hour-long site visit. We spent time outside of the, you know, meetings that had been on the calendar. We spent time outside of, you know, discussing a grant report. Um, my funders really came and spent time with me, with my board, with my staff, and with the community, and we had drinks. It's not about the drinks part, but it's about the being social and sort of interacting on a more human level that helps, you know, remove some of those power dynamics and, and be outside of the regular setting of the office or the pre-planned site visit. So. I'm not, I'm not encouraging this audience to go drink all the time with your grantees, but I am suggesting, you know, take her advice on how can you have a more casual conversation that is not so scripted. And I would so- totally second that. Most of the work that I do is usually by phone because of the number of grants that I, that I do. So I don't have a chance to visit as many people as I would like. Um, and, and so how do I do? I do something as close to getting a drink as possible on the phone, which is really about tone yep. and being uh, candid and casual um, and trying to, uh, to loosen, you know, loosen our ties a little bit on the phone yep. as much as we can so that it, it's not as formal and it's not as high pressure. And so you can get to some of those hard, vulnerable mo- moments. Yep. And increasingly, a lot of funders, too, who are phone funders um, have switched to video funders. So especially with like Google Hangout, Skype, Uvu, I don't want to be like brand I want to be brand agnostic here. So any of the video conferencing um, tools, you can use them. And even just, I I have one funder. She has like a really fun bulletin board that's always like changing behind her. And I know that that sounds so silly, but it's sort of nice to see people in their environment. And even that makes it, you know, we have funders too. We're a nonprofit, right? So it's really nice to interact with our funders in that way as well. So video can be a tool. And I think I saw one hand in the back, and then maybe we'll we'll take a little break after that. Did I? No? Just a stretch. Excellent. I can make it coherent. Um, my name is Nancy Schillens. I'm with the Thomas J. Long Foundation. Um, uh, I wanted to go back to, to make it, I think you said your theory of change had to do with leadership management and operations, right? So I'm wondering if through this organizational effectiveness work that organizations do, what if they find out that they have the wrong leadership? Or they find out that you know the staffing for operations are man- it, it's it's wrong staffing and it's really I mean that's that's the issue that needs to be mm-hmm. addressed mm-hmm. or is it such that the, the only organizations that get organizational effectiveness you know assistance or capacity building have already been vetted by by the program staff right because mm-hmm. you only give those kind of grants to existing entities mm-hmm. so is it that that part's already been, that's not, not an issue because it's already been dead as a leadership and management operations part. I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah, no, yeah. Just I'm just going to repeat it for live stream. Sorry. Um, so, so Nancy asked a, a question about, you know, when you do an assessment and you, you sort of figure out that staffing might actually be the issue, um, what do you do? And do you have that problem so much given that um, you work with existing grantees? Mm-hmm. That was a big summary, but I hope that sort of encapsulates. So definitely it has come up through the various different types of projects that we do that there do need to be staffing changes, um, whether that's new staff brought in or just changes to the existing staff. So definitely that has occurred. Um, On the projects I've worked on so far, it hasn't been um, as dramatic as the ED that started the project. um, It's now clear that they need need to be booted. (laughs) So it's never been that situation. Um, but for, for, for the other situations where it's other staff members, um, definitely we've, we've dealt with that. Um, usually the organization, we don't usually fund organizations that are in crisis. Mm-hmm. We definitely fund executive transitions, um, uh, but organizations that are in real crisis, either because of massive st- staff turnover or financial issues, um, we don't feel like that's the right moment for us to inject ourselves. Sometimes program actually makes a grant that helps in that moment, but, but we, don't, we don't do that capacity building. Um, so on the, on the grants where, uh, where there may be staff changes, I think that's a fine outcome. Uh, and there definitely are surprise outcomes sometimes. 
And one thing we frequently say is OE work begets more OE work <laughs> because in that situation, if you realize that your new strategic plan calls for a completely different staff, then the next step is, oh, well, we need an operational and, and staffing plan that matches this new strategic plan and we didn't have enough funding. We didn't know we'd need to cover that. And so sometimes that's us that we step in and help in that way. Sometimes other funders are ready to help at that point. Sometimes it's included in the programmatic grant. It really depends on the situation. But I, you know, that's definitely something that, that has come up. And something else related to staffing, not quite an answer to your question, but just another point um, that we talk about in the guide is, is really looking at in a capacity building effort, is your effort grounded in like one person at the foundation and one person at the nonprofit organization? Or is this like an organizational compatibility? So that's to say like if if you're like leading program officer on a cause were to leave, like would the foundation still be behind it? And similarly, like if you're if you're feeling confident in an organization solely because of like one leader and that person were to leave, mm -hmm. as as happens with good talent in the sector, people move on. Is the effort sort of going to <laughs> going to still work? Right. Um, and that's not a reason to do or not to do, but it's another consideration that we definitely highlight with how much how much are you putting in single staff versus large organizations. Well, another thing to say on that, um, which I could have said in the sort of what makes a good capacity building yeah. grant section is we definitely think about um, making grants that will have an organizational level impact. Mm -hmm. We definitely also fund things uh, and projects that work to support individuals in the organization, such as executive coaching or leadership training, things like that. But the vast majority of, of our projects, we're looking for organizational level transformational outcomes. We also fund at the network level and at the field level as well. Great. Well, we could keep this conversation going forever. <laughs> um, what, what I think we'll do is um, I'd love to just ask for like your like what are your last thoughts? Like I, you know, Packard is one animal. Every foundation is its own animal. Mm -hmm. What's what's the thing or couple things that you want people to go back to their organizations and and sort of know or do with capacity building? Well, I guess I just. I think it's an artificial distinction, distinction to say you can fund program and not fund capacity building. Um, because without a strong management leadership and operational foundation, um, organizations risk failure. So having that strong foundation is so important um, that someone needs to be thinking about it. The organizational leaders of those organizations are thinking about it. So it's important for funders to think about it too. And then the other thing I would say is related to making good capacity building grants and something that I've already said many times already is the importance of listening and remembering that um, especially sitting in the funder seat that the, the grantee, the organization, the ex executive leader who's living and breathing it every day um, probably knows a lot more about their organizational needs than we do what, sitting what, in whatever office we're sitting in. Um, and so I definitely make, never make the assumption that I know more about their situation than they do. That's great. And I will, I'll share mine from sort of a field building perspective as someone who works for Foundation Center does. Um, I, people have been funding capacity building for decades and there are resources, but a lot of them take like a very top level approach or, you know, are very theoretical. And what I really believe moves practice is the, the very personal telling of stories like you've done today. And so I encourage sort of everyone to think about what is your story, whether it's about capacity building specifically, which I hope it is because that's why we're all here, or sort of more broadly, what's a story that you can share to help others improve their practice and also then to listen to other stories. Um, and you can do that through GrantCraft. Um, anyone can sort of submit content. Um, you can always be in touch with me, jen at foundationcenter.org, um, you know, with any questions. Um, but I just want to, it's one of my personal and professional goals to really increase sharing of quality stories in the field. Um, so that would sort of be mine. And I think with that, what we'll do is we'll say goodbye to our live stream audience. Bye. Um, thanks so much for joining. Um, you are always welcome to join us in person somewhere, but we're glad that you joined us virtually. Um, so for you guys, if you have any follow-up questions, again, just email me, jen at foundationcenter.org. Um,